two witnesses from Pewitt Place who will speak to their submission, Dr. Philippa White and Ms. Jennifer Aldred. Perhaps if you could introduce yourself, um, Dr. White. Thank you. I'm Dr. Philippa White, the Director of Tewitt Place in Fremantle WA. Thank you. I'm Chairperson Jennifer Aldrich. I'm also Vice, sorry, Vice Chairperson of the Board of Forgotten Australians and a care leader. And, and a, a care survivor. Thank you. Uh, can I invite you to speak to your submission? Um, yes, good afternoon. Um, as I said, my name's Jennifer Aldrich and I'm a Vice Chairperson of the Board of Forgotten Australians Coming Together which is the governing body of Tewitt Place in Western Australia. I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse while in the care of the state at Parkable Children's Home. I am also one of nine siblings separated when forced to become a ward of the state in WA. I would like to thank the Royal Commission for the opportunity to speak as an ambassador for care survivors in Western Australia. Firstly, I would like to convey to you a message from a survivor, Maxine, who suffered horrifically as a child while in several institutions in WA. This is what Maxine wrote. As an ex-state ward who was seriously let down by the government, I felt disillusioned by the cut to redress WA, suffering from severe depression most of my life due to the abuse I received during my time in care, and I have only recently received the proper treatment. Now in my 60s and living with a progressive disability, my future looks bleak. When redress was first mentioned, my hopes for a half-decent future looked brighter. But when redress was cut in half, all those hopes dissolved. I felt disregarded and hopeless all over again, just like I did when I was a child in care. Not because of the money, but because I felt like the government didn't care, like I wasn't good enough or damaged enough to matter. The reduced redress now leaves me with a very uncertain future. Like Maxine, there are many survivors who suffered all forms of abuse while in state care in Western Australia, who are still suffering the effects of their past on a daily basis. I am aware from other survivors who have shared their pain with me while attending Hewitt Place how damaging it was when the payment levels were almost halved in July 2004, 2009 sorry, after all the applications had been received. We bared our souls and relived the horror night after night, only to feel demoralised yet again, which confirmed that the abuse we suffered as children was not seen in the eyes of authority as worthy of honouring the promise made. If they were building a road, they wouldn't have stopped halfway through. They would have found the money to honour that commitment. While in state care, I was subjected to physical, sexual and emotional abuse, which left me with deep scars. I had huge trust issues, which I am still working to overcome. It has affected any chance of me ever having a loving relationship. It took a lot of courage for me to apply to redress. I was re-traumatised. With each session, I had to relive every detail of my abuse. The nightmares returned, and I had to start back on antidepressants in order to get through each day. My first thought when I heard about redress was, I hope that if I tell them what happened to me, maybe someone might actually believe me. In terms of recommendations, I would like to see Redress WA reopened without a time limit because, as we said in our submission, we now know that some of the most seriously abused people missed out on the scheme. I would also like to see the original payment levels honoured for previous applicants. What this would do would be to send a message to WA care survivors that they do matter and that the government takes their abuse seriously. I would also like to see more involvement by care survivors in the governance of services for forgotten Australians and former child migrants. As is my experience, it is empowering for survivors to have opportunities to contribute and have a say in the running of their own services. Thank you for listening to me today. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you my views on redress and I encourage people to read the Tewitt Place submission. I would now like to introduce you to Philip, Dr Philippa White, the Director of Short Place. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Commissioners, for inviting us to speak today. Short Place is the state government funded service for care survivors in WA. It's a no wrong door, one stop shop resource service offering a range of options and services. Short Place is participant led and five of our ten board members are care leavers. 
our Vice Chairperson Jenny Aldrich spoke about the importance of survivors having opportunities for meaningful engagement and leadership. It's no coincidence that Tuart Place was founded by a care leaver and that care leavers continue to lead the service. Jenny spoke to you from the perspective of lived experience. The views of other survivors are reported in the Tuart Place submission. I'm speaking today as a clinician who's worked with West Australian care, care survivors for the last 10 years and who operated the principal support service for the Redress WA scheme. If I could make only one observation about what I've learned over this time, it would be that we too often underestimate the extent to which survivors are affected by redress and complaints processes. The potential for re-traumatisation and secondary harm is huge. And I don't think we fully understand the implications of what we're asking people to do. Yes, pull that paper. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. During the Redress WA scheme, applicants often told us that detailing their childhood abuse felt as bad as the abuse itself. And in the years since the scheme, we've heard repeatedly from people that they've never felt the same since Redress WA. As Jenny pointed out, for many people, the, the positive outcomes of Redress WA were overshadowed by the negative message received by applicants when pa the promised payment levels were reduced. Survivors taking part in other complaints processes are also harmed when those systems fail. However, even when things go smoothly, these processes are inherently fraught. We should not ask people to participate in them without providing adequate support. It is also important to offer psychoeducation to survivors going through these processes. It's helpful to know that it's normal to feel bad when you talk in detail about your childhood abuse. If people have this information, they're less likely to see it as a personal weakness or think they're losing their sanity. While revisiting one's childhood abuse through adult eyes may be an essential feature of therapeutic recovery, documenting the details of childhood abuse and identifying the negative effects for a redress process is an acute stressor and survivors should not be rushed into any process. The hopes of many survivors have been dashed by yesterday's announcement that the federal government does not support the idea of a national redress scheme. This announcement will disappoint many and demonstrates once again that large bureaucracies are not well equipped to deal with people's painful emotions. Normal bureaucratic events such as long delays and disappointing decisions carry with them a complex set of potentially very damaging outcomes when those affected are survivors of child abuse. The degree of hurt that will arise from yesterday's announcement confirms our view that any system working with survivors of childhood abuse in institutional settings needs to recognise that the results of abuse are often carried through life and that this group's distrust of the system is easily reinforced. It is certainly the view of Tuart Place that a national redress scheme represents the gold standard and would be the most desirable option. It would rectify the inequities in our present situation in which the availability and level of redress depends on the particulars of where abuse occurred. However, our primary message is that whatever forms of redress are offered to abuse survivors, it is paramount that the processes themselves inflict no further harm. Tuart Place's first submission on Issues Paper 6 set out guidelines for the operation of an effective complaints process, and further protocols are proposed in our current submission. If there is to be no national redress scheme, there is still great value in developing a set of national standards and best practice principles to inform the work of state governments and institutions wanting to provide an appropriate response to victims of child abuse in institutional settings. Jenny and I would like to once again thank the Commission for inviting Tuart Place here today and thank you for what you're trying to achieve on behalf of survivors. Thank, thank you. you. Just a couple of issues I think we'd all like just to hear you expand on. 
Um, your submission contemplates a process which involves lawyers, is that, is that right? That's right, yes. Uh, some people will say to us, keep all the lawyers out. They should all be banned yes. from any, coming anywhere near something like this. What's the perspective that leads you to say the lawyers should be there? Um, I was very much of that view uh, that you just mentioned, that lawyers should not be allowed in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and I still have reservations. I think it's really important that uh, lawyers involved in mediation processes uh, are trained in non-adversarial approaches and that they're sensitive to the fact that this is about so much more than money for survivors. Um, my view has changed uh, in regard to the cha in response to the changing times. Um, uh, we had a process in WA where Towards Healing had some very good psychological and emotional outcomes uh, for people, but then when the Royal Commission came along we realised that people uh, in WA had generally received lower payments than people in other states, and that's possibly because lawyers were involved in other states. I think that having lawyers involved protects the rights of both parties and that uh, done sensitively it's a good idea to have them. Secondly, you contemplate a process which has a first decision um, with a right of review. Now, um, do you see the survivor as having, if required by the institution, mm -hmm. to actually speak and relate orally their history and for there to be lawyers present when that's done? Yes, absolutely. And that's a lawyer from the institution too? Yes, yes, for both parties. And able parents. to ask questions? Um, uh, with, with limitations, yes. It should be... Uh, it, by the time the parties meet in the room, uh, it, it, there should be basic agreement on, um, on the the facts presented and, uh, and on the likely outcome of that meeting. Um, so uh, I don't think that it's appropriate to have uh, lawyers for the institution um, firing difficult questions. What do we employers. do if the institution says, through its alleged abuser, this didn't happen? Well, that would that that conversation would take part before take place before there's any face-to-face -face meeting. So, um, uh, I mean, this is the kind of problem that's confronted all the time. If where there are abusers who have considerable form, then um, you know it's it's more likely to be accepted. But if it's uh, if we're talking about someone who's never been named before. Then um, and they're dead. It's more difficult to uh, to establish that, but that that should all be sorted out before there's any face-to-face -face meeting. And the review process that you contemplate would that be a review by someone looking at papers, or again, would you see the survivor having to orally present to the review decision maker? Uh, I think that that could be variable. I would only propose a review process if the outcome of um, uh, the first instance was unsatisfactory. So uh, it's, it's, it's an avenue of appeal, basically. So there's an opportunity for the institution to respond in a, in a uh, direct and uh, pastoral way, and I see the financial offer as a, as a significant component of the pastoral response. It's a, symbol, a concrete symbol of, uh, of the apology. In your submission, and I appreciate thought, real thoughts being given to this, the suggestion is that if there's been a previous payment under a redress scheme, that should be disregarded altogether. Um, now, some institutions and some governments might say that's not really fair, uh, that it should be looked at as a total package and a previous payment may be a part payment. Yes. Um, the views reported in our submission are the results of a survey mm -hmm. and of a focus group. Mm -hmm. And when we asked that question, should previous payments be taken into account, there was a resounding no, mm -hmm. they should not. Mm -hmm. And we then had a discussion about it and people could 
recognise that not all care survivors might feel the same, that if, if they hadn't received a payment before, that they might feel it was unfair. But I think that people feel so damaged um, uh, by their experiences, um, some by the redress scheme, um, the money is never enough, and that there's a sense, well, if there's a new process starting up, um, uh, it should be a clean slate. Uh, I can also see the other side uh, of the argument. Yeah, I'm sure you understand the commissioners are all deeply appreciative of the problems and issues that survivors face. Um, but is it understood by your members that a redress scheme could never provide the equivalent of common law damages? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. people recognise that. Um, one, of the, one of the risks, of course, in the redress scheme is that it will never be enough. Yeah. Uh, in a genuine sense, never be enough to meet some people's yeah. needs. Absolutely. And, and healing starts on the inside. No one out there can, can heal people. It's, uh, and people abused in domestic settings, um, they never get an apology or any financial offer. Um, it's great when those things line up and work well, uh, but it, uh, it's not essential and it, it's not the starting point for recovery, for sure. Now, just one matter, if I can. Um, Dr White, you also say in your statement that um, there's a need for independent financial counselling and that's independent of Centrelink. Yes. What, what are the thoughts behind that? Um, do you have any comments on Centrelink, Jim? Not really. OK. Sorry about that. Um, we've heard time and time again from people uh, over the years that people don't trust Centrelink um, and they're fearful of um, uh, Centrelink cutting payments and um, uh, they wouldn't want to use a financial counselling service offered by Centrelink because they, even though I understand it is separate and confidential, um, they, th there's a lack of trust. That, there, that there's actually independence. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honour. Uh, just one more question. Uh, Dr White, um, it is a characteristic of many uh, survivors of institutional abuse uh, that they lack trust in authority and um, in institutions, and therefore they seek support services which, um, in which they feel comfortable and that they belong. Uh, generally speaking, those exist outside the system, as yeah. it were. Uh, you have said that you thought support services should be funded by past providers. Yeah. Uh, what are your thoughts with respect to a formal inclusion in a redress system for providers of that sort? The, the formal inclusion of funding by past providers, do you mean? or Well, uh, the fact is that... Um, organisations like yourself, and there are many others, yep. quite a few others, um, exist outside a formal structure of states and yes. commonwealth provided services. Yep. Uh, how do you think they should fit into a redress system? Um, uh, I would imagine that they uh, should be funded through, through a redress scheme if they're carrying out work uh, connected to that scheme. Um, and that support services of, of varying kinds are all part of providing redress. So Have you thought through how that should be done? I haven't given it any thought, no. If, if you choose to, you, you can advise us of your thoughts on that matter. Yeah, I will do, Commissioner Murray. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ron. Yes, thank you both for your time and efforts and seeking to help the Commission resolve our very large problems. Mm. Thank you indeed. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.